Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, I am Brian Egger from Bloomberg Intelligence. Wonderful to be here with uh, Thomas and Tomer. You can learn more, more about us up there and on LinkedIn, for sure. Um, the race to profitability. It's a really timely topic. I spend my day covering public gaming companies. They're all talking about making customer acquisition efforts more targeted or reducing them overall uh, and making the process more efficient. Uh, we've got a great panel here today. Um, I'm, I want to kick it right off by talking about um, some of the tools involved, particularly predictive analytics and how those analytics are helping companies um, tailor their promotions uh, in a more effective way. I'll start out with that and I'll get more specific. Thomas, we'll start. Sure. Um, I find this really interesting. You know, once upon a time, you rewind a couple of years ago, if you want to quantify success of an acquisition campaign, it was pretty simple. You have your advertising mediums, you look at your CPA, what's working, what's not working. Fast forward a little bit later, all of a sudden we realize we want to have rotating offers in the marketplace to have different things to cater to different audiences. Now all of a sudden you can look at CPAs of sign-up offers and things of that nature. But now in today's world, we're starting to look more of the seasonality effect. We're realizing the lifetime value of a customer who might sign up on Super Bowl Sunday versus a random Tuesday made during the MLB season. And we're trying to quantify how long does it take to break even on a customer and how do you finally find a customer that's profitable. Um, I kind of use the analogy when you kind of go to a restaurant, you have this diversified product of, hey, I can have an $80 steak, I have a $10 hamburger, but there's something for everybody. And I like to have diversified offers that make sense of that nature. But we just need to be mindful that now we're not giving too much money to the wrong users, where you hear the term bonus abusers way too much in our field, where they're taking money, they play, and they disappear. So it's really important to quantify what offers we're giving to the users, but be mindful of looking ahead with these predictive analysis, ML models, whatever you want to use, to predict how long will it take to break even. And if that's not the case, maybe do a more subtle offer, so more cost savings to use for different types of customers. Tomer? Sure, yeah. Um, so um, just kind of like before I maybe address the question, um, we, we've analyzed uh, data from more than 10 million bets that were done in the US, and that gave us some key stats from operators that we work with. Um, so I'll, I'll throw in some numbers here as a comic like I try to address the question. But in general, for me, when you think about predictive models, right, it's, it starts, it's the notion of like learning from the past, right? I want to learn what happened in the past and employ that for any future behavior, right? That's pretty regular and, 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 and expected uh, assumption here, right? So for example, knowing, and that's what we've seen, that after February, going to March Madness, 30% of the player, you're only gonna be able to retain 30% of the players of the first time depositors that you had, right? That's kind of general numbers that we saw last year. So how does that uh, correlate? How does that impact your expectations for, um, from your players, from your uh, marketing communication as you think about employing predictive models, right? So. That's just kind of like one example of, of how we think about it. So in general, when we think about profitability, when we think about bonusing and predictive model, for me, it's about being recognizing that um, giving bonuses is going to impact our, prof our profits. And you would, I mean, funny enough, not everybody understand that, right? Because in gaming, not all those bonuses transit into actual loss, right? Not all the promotions are actually being used in, in many ways. Um, so recognizing that it does happen, recognizing the segments and the sub subgroups of customers that behave differently, and then being consistent with the messaging, right? So learning from the past predictive models will, would really help with that. And so you talk about uh, trying to maintain profitability, a lot of first-time depositors. We've just come off the Super Bowl, obviously a time that's particularly challenging uh, because you're getting this influx of first-time depositors, and at the same time, you have to maintain profitability, and it's not an easy thing. How, are there any specific tools you use to deal with that seasonal influx of first-time depositors that you often see? Yeah, it's a great question. I think it's a challenge that all of us operators are facing right now, and that's one thing, kind of taking a step back, what I love about A-B testing different offers, you're able to identify what types of users they're going to be based on the original acquisition offer, and now all of a sudden you can segment them and funnel them into a current offer that makes sense to you. So what helps us sometimes is, look, a deposit match up to 1,000 customer, it's gonna be a little different than a bet five get to 100 customer. So having the different AB offers from the acquisition side actually helps your retention team, because now you can start modeling 
what you expect their future behavior to look like right now. And I think that's one of the challenges you mentioned earlier with the Super Bowl players or any of these high tentpole events is how do you keep them engaged? But then the question is, are these the kind of customers that only show up a few times a year? You just want to be mindful of how much you want to give them, knowing that you might not see them for a few more months to make sure those margins make sense to you. Yeah, so so in terms of like some numbers on that, right? So um, funny, I mean, I might be very intuitive for the audience here, but but as you get closer to like major events, obviously you see an increase in, in first-time depositors, and but a major decrease in bet amount. I'm talking about like playoffs is like, 36% decrease in, in the bet amount, Super Bowl 50% decrease in, in the bet amount that we see from players, obviously with a major increase with uh, first, first time depositors for, for the operators. Um, so, so that's kind of like one aspect that we need to, to think about when we kind of like trying to address this, uh, this situation. Another very interesting stat is the pregame bets versus the live bet, right? So we also see like, that 86% of the players that are playing the Super Bowl, for example, would be betting pregame, like one bet, single bet, that's it, and you would have the rest doing the live bets, right? So right. there's obviously correlation between the same game parlays and the more sophistication and bigger bet amounts to profitability versus the first-time the, the, the first bettors, the maybe one-time bettors are coming to the Super Bowl, and that's it in terms of... The, the profitability that uh, the operators uh, see. So, um, so yeah, w with that in mind, I definitely think that A-B testing is, is definitely, um, you know, one way to think about that. Um, but again, recognizing the numbers is, is a good starting point in terms of how we think about tailoring the generosity level and how we tailor the messaging. And obviously, there's a lot of um, mechanisms that, that even Optimum has that, that could really help with uh, personalizing the message and, and identifying segments. So when you talk about personalizing the marketing and tailoring marketing, when you have both first-time customers as well as repeat customers, a lot of things have to be balanced at once. And it, it, it would seemingly be challenging. You've got to engage players. You've got to uh, engage them, but also avoid kind of the marketing fatigue of throwing too much at them. Uh, you've got to find a way to maintain their loyalty and I think this is where it gets even more complex. You've got to try to find a way to mitigate problem gambling and to use the analytical tools at your disposal, whether it's AI or analytics, to balance all of those mandates and priorities. So I'd love to hear more about your thoughts about how you go about doing that. Yeah, this is a great question. And it's really interesting because I feel like when people talk about these ML models, you're looking at historical betting patterns, trying to identify what their future trends are. And what I find really interesting is there's so many things we can control, and there's other things we can't control. Um, so, for example, internally, we could create our ML models of looking like, hey, what is the past head betting history? What's their touch points? What's their bet count look like? What does their handle look like? But what happens when there's external factors that we don't control that impact these models and switch things up? So, for example, in the sports betting world, you know, let's say I'm a big New York Jets fan. Uh, week one, we all know what happened to Aaron Rodgers. Now, all of a sudden, what happens to someone who might be doing overs unders on the Jets each week? What happens when they have their futures for winning the Super Bowl? There's external factors that happen to the teams if it's injuries, trades, momentum, winning streaks. That's going to influence the player's behavior, how they want to bet, and how much they're willing to bet. And I think the people on top are going to figure out those AI models of our internal betting history, but how do we impact those future things that we cannot control that are outside our control? Yeah, and I think just maybe uh, just to add to that, right? So I think content is is a key part, right? So again, this, the topic of this uh, panel is is getting out of the generosity habit, and I think that employing more content and educational information as part of the marketing plan is going to play a key role in in that. And again, when we think about um, maybe the new trend of AI and and how can we really be better at offering those messages. In, obviously, while differentiating at-risk players, while identifying different sub-segments within even the campaign and the or in the communication we're planning for for the players, um, you know, just to give like another example, right? We we have like this um, capability to do what's called self-optimizing campaign, which is taking the A/B testing and over time identifying micro segments within the audience and kind of like divert the A/B testing towards those micro segments. So 
if you will, instead of like generalizing the message saying, oh, A was better than B, I'm just going to do A, I'm actually going to find the sub-segments that B was better for them as well and keep doing B for those that it's relevant. So B can be the content, A could be the generosity, right? That alone, one of our customers, for example, for one campaign was able to get 7% more on their uplift in bad amount and which translate to $300,000 more in bad amount for one single campaign, just for an example. Um, the timing of the message, right? We saw 50% increase in bed amount just by timing the message correctly. So these are like small nuances, small details that obviously you have to have framework of, you know, AI data and things like that that will help you with that. But these are the nuances you have to think about when you're trying to uh, optimize for that. So uh, this is fascinating stuff to me. I mean, if you you, you obviously find ways to tear all these promotions. But also, you know, you're, you're trying to optimize the customer's lifetime value, right? It's not just about one season. Um, you're adjusting generosity to maximize their lifetime value and to gain insights from their initial actions. Uh, I want to bring this back to how do, you, how do you optimize the lifetime value while at the same time making sure that the increased propensity to play is a function of what you're doing is working as opposed to they're developing a problem uh, with, with gambling. And I think Thomas and I had this discussion even before our session today. Yeah, this is a really interesting one because as a marketing team, we all have our K, uh, primary KPIs. What are your daily active users? What are their APUs? What is your uplift? And kind of what are your monthly budgets and tailored towards that? So, for example, let's say there's a certain weeks, you know, we, we're talking about post-Super Bowl because we're in that time window right now. Hey, someone who used to bet four days a week is now down to two days a week. We're trying to find different incentives to bring them back. But here's the fine line. What happens if this is a consumer who normally never bets on a Wednesday? We're pushing all these special promotions. Play today. Are you, hey, winning a share of wall from a different competitor? Or are you forcing a behavior that might not be RG friendly to incentivize wagering on a day they may not want to? And that's trying to find that fine line of taking back market share, trying to win back players who might play a little bit more, but by not unintentionally creating unhealthy betting habits. And, and, and I think that another angle, another interesting angle is like, um, again, very small details sometimes can really make a difference here when you think about lifetime value. And again, trying to make, a, for example, a first time depositor to come back and make a second deposit, right? So one, one area is the acquisition source, right? How do we get that first time depositor? What, what was the response to, to what advertisement, to what channel? They come from Facebook, they come from Google, they come from wherever. Um, so just even really analyzing and using the data we get from the very first moment we, we see that new player and then using that and employing that for our retention uh, strategy, again, you'll be surprised how much that is not happening today um, in the U.S. And generally, operators are not um, as good as, as, as they could be on, 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 that, uh, on that front. Um, another, another point I mentioned, consistency earlier, so... so, so when you think about like um, the message you give to the players, the content, for example, in the email, and what they see when they come to the site itself, right? So if we've seen, for example, um, in the casino space, um, like 53% um, increase to bet amount just by optimizing the banners on an email and being consistent with the with the homepage and with the layout of the, of, of the app or, or whatever the site, whatever the, the operations are, um, to the player themselves. So again, lifetime value correlate a lot with the experience and the nuances of that uh, versus the, pray, the, the, the spray and pray approach that um, a lot of uh, operators out there are, are still employing. Spray and pray, like that. that's, I'll yeah. remember that one. <laughs> um, the, bringing us back to the title, Overcoming the, the Generosity Habit, I'm curious to know how you work with your, your counterparts and your principals to um, help them measure what success looks like that because because we've talked about how the focus is on reducing and tailoring and targeting marketing and promotional efforts. <clears throat> but from the, your perspective and from their perspective, how do you help them define whether they're doing that successfully, whether it's a good return on investment, whether it's 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 cost effective? How do we, how would they know they're actually succeeding at that broader mandate? Yeah, it's a great question. I feel like when you hear the term generosity, it really just depends on how you define generosity. The reality is not two players are the same, and we have to tailor different offers to different users based on what they're playing for us. 
look, if you're somebody who only bets $100 a week, a $25 free bet is going to look pretty good. You do that same offer to someone who bets $100,000 a month, they're going to be furious. So you just want to be proportionate of understanding what are they bringing to the table and are you bringing something back in return? Um, when you really think about it, outside of our industry, how many different types of products or industries you say, come back to us, here's all this money, here are all these offers time and time again. There's short-term sales, there's flash sales and retail, things of that nature. But I feel like customers are expecting this now. And the question is, how do you turn it back a little bit to be, how it's become more organic? But the flip side is now as an operator, all your competitors are doing something different. So you have to maintain a level of competitiveness at the same time. So you're kind of in a catch-22 to find that balancing act. Yeah, I think Thomas made a very good point here. Uh, I'll just add that, you know, one more thing we can do in a very simple manner is test versus control, right? So so of, after all has been said and done, um, you could very easily employ uh, a test where you kind of like send the campaign to a certain group of people and then you have a representative statistical credible group that represent the test group. They get nothing. They still maintain their natural behavior. They still might come and place a bet or make a deposit or what have you. And then you see the incremental increase. It's it's not an easy, it's not a, an innovative approach. It's, I think it's, you know, a lot of operators are employing that today. Um, I think the challenge might be how you drive that insight into action quickly. Um, that might be more challenging today. But if you're an operator and you're not using test and control, you're definitely missing out on the the the, the statistical understanding whether what you're doing is working or not. And we're seeing a lot of campaigns that have negative impact on the player's, you know, bet amount, deposit amount, and general value of that player. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, that's great. I mean, I'll, I'll finish. We have two minutes left. I'll finish up with one more question, bringing it back to the customer. I'm curious to know how you go about trying to make the mobile betting experience seamless to them. Uh, so that you're doing the things you need to accomplish, you're optimizing profitability, tailoring promotions, but at the same time, not being obtrusive and making it a, a kind of a seamless user experience. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, in my eyes, when you hear user experience, it's twofold. It's the messaging to get them back into the app, and what does it look like once you're in the app? And for me, you know, you always hear that silly cliche, silly, you know, K-I-S-S, keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> well, it's true. If someone says, hey, I'm opting in to push, these are the types of messages I want, Give the customer what they want. If your North Star is taking care of your customers first, just listen to them. And if you have your own internal goals, yes, you could do some uplift. You could do some more things in the future, but just keep in mind the customer first. And what's fun with this industry is a lot of us are customers and fans too. Just put yourself in the customer's shoes and what do you like, what's obtrusive, and just kind of make what makes sense to you. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with that. I think I think that um, you know making sure that you really – tailor the, the recommendation that you, you, you show players. W one of the nuances we have there, by the way, is that when you make a recommendation to a player for a certain game or, or a bet or whatnot, sometimes you want to think about justifying why are you making that, that recommendation? Because if they lose, they'll blame you that you did that and, and to get money out of them, right? So, so again, a lot of like small things, nuances, really get into the mindset of your players, really become customer-centric and understand what they think about. Maybe they're unlucky with you. How do you deal with that? How do you yep. tackle that? Um, and then you have to be consistent about it, right? It's not just, okay, I'm going to optimize this button on the app. It's also the email. It's also the push notifications. You know, across the board, they are one player across all those channels. Awesome. Listen, thank you, everybody. Thanks very much to Thomas, to Tomer, uh, for me as well, Brian Egger. Actually, it's E-G-G-E-R, but that's that's okay. It's You got most of the letters there. Um, thank you so much for uh, being with us today. Thank you for your time. Thank you.